nous entamons notre première table de discussion. Donc, pour celle-ci, euh, je vais inviter euh, euh, Marie-Josée Hébert, qui va animer euh, la table de discussion qui s'appelle « De l'importance de l'improbable ». Et j'inviterai aussi les cinq lauréats euh, des prix euh, Kilam, euh, les quatre, en fait, qui sont ici présents, à venir euh, s'asseoir. Donc, euh, on accueille André Godreau de l'Université de Montréal, qui est lauréat du prix Kilam 2018 euh, en sciences euh, humaines. Euh, Walter Ergos, qui est euh, lauréat du prix Kilam 2018 en génie, euh, qui est de l'Université de Calgary. On invite aussi Janet Welker de l'Université de Colombie-Britannique, qui est lauréat du prix Kilam 2018 en sciences sociales. Et euh, on invite euh, Vladimir Hachinsky de l'Université Western, qui est lauréat du prix Kilam 2018 en sciences de la santé. Donc, je te laisse l'animation, ma Josie. Merci, Julie. Alors, euh, moi, je vous propose que nous commencions par une histoire. So, we're going to start with a story, a great story, a good story. Et euh, l'histoire que je veux vous raconter, c'est une histoire euh, improbable entre cinq scientifiques et qui se termine dans un taxi. C'est euh, l'histoire du prix Kilam, de la cérémonie des prix Kilam 2018, où on se retrouve à Halifax. Et on se retrouve à Halifax euh, à nos risques et périls. André et moi, puisque André fait un premier vol pour se rendre à Halifax, réussit pas à atterrir, revient à Montréal. Son épouse décide qu'elle l'aime beaucoup, mais qu'elle le laisse retourner tout seul à Halifax. Moi, j'arrive le soir en retard pour les mêmes raisons de conditions météo. Alors, on a la Société royale où nous sommes tous. Et là, on se dit, le lendemain, bien, on a la réception des prix qu'il a, mais on espère tous en sortir vivant. On a la grande chance d'être reçu euh, par euh, le lieutenant-gouverneur de, euh, de la Nouvelle-Écosse, euh, qui nous reçoit donc dans un contexte beaucoup plus intime que ce que l'on a habituellement pour une cérémonie qu'il a. On en est content. Et on a, suite à vos discours qui ont tous été très inspirants, on a donc des petits fours. Alors ça, c'est un autre ingrédient improbable, les petits fours. Et euh, donc, on se met à discuter. Alors, je me souviens très bien que Vladimir, Janet et André euh, commencent à discuter. Qu'est-ce qui nous unit? Qu'est-ce que vous faites? Euh, Vladimir commence à parler de musique euh, et là, j'assiste à un moment privilégié où est-ce que je vois cinq chercheurs euh, établis manifestement au fait de leur carrière qui sont comme trois enfants dans un magasin de jouets parce qu'ils ont trouvé quelque chose qui les unit, qu euh, avec une gymnastique intellectuelle, avec une curiosité euh, euh, contagieuse, commence à se dire, mais ah, qu'est-ce que c'est ça? Qu -ce qui nous... Et là, André qui part, où sont les autres? Et qui va chercher, et qui va euh, chercher euh, Walter, qui cherche, euh, euh, qui cherche notre ami euh, euh, Pinfold, et qui dit, comment, ça, comment, ça, on, comment on pourrait travailler ça ensemble? Alors, avec un enthousiasme, encore une fois, contagieux. Et moi, je me sens privilégiée d'avoir vu ça, mais je dois m'en retourner au péril de ma vie, à Montréal. Et donc, euh, Tara, la pointe, et moi, nous décidons que nous partageons le même taxi. Hein? Donc, les petits fours et maintenant le taxi. Et dans le taxi, Tara et moi, nous discutons de cette discussion-là, hein, qui était improbable, jusqu'à quel point nous étions, de la part du Conseil des arts qu'il a, mais de la part de l'Université de Montréal, euh, nous étions enthousiasmés par cet échange euh, d'idées. Et on se dit, comment on va réussir à, à s'assurer que c'est un moment magique qui a une pérennité dans le temps? Il y avait donc, il y a eu une série d'éléments improbables dans cette rencontre-là qui nous ont menés jusqu'à aujourd'hui. Euh, quelle a été la place de l'improbable dans vos carrières respectives? 
comment on se lance là-dedans. Alors, moi, je vous demande d'abord quelle a été la place de l'improbable et quelle a et comment vous avez vécu la rencontre de Halifax. Est-ce que Halifax était improbable? Moi, je peux peut-être commencer en disant que le plus improbable, euh, ben, parmi les plus improbables, il y a aussi le fait que la remise des prix devait se faire à Ottawa au mois de mai-juin. Puis pour des raisons trop longues à expliquer, ça n'a pas eu lieu. Ça a été reporté en novembre. Si ça avait eu lieu à Ottawa, qui dit que l'improbable serait survenu, les, les petits fours auraient peut-être été trop euh, gâteux, ou je ne sais pas quoi, peut-être meilleurs, je ne sais pas. Il y aurait peut-être eu une foule plus grande à Ottawa qu'à... Bon, je ne sais pas. D'une part. D'autre part, par ailleurs, le fait que ma femme ne soit pas venue et que ce jour-là, c'était mon 18e anniversaire de mariage, peut-être aurait fait qu'elle aurait été avec moi et qu'au lieu de traîner avec euh, les, les premiers kilomètres du bar, excusez-moi de l'image, j'aurais été avec ma femme pour qu'on se dise, yeah, c'est le fun, 18 ans, etc. Et que donc, nous ne serions peut-être pas ici. OK. Donc ça, c'est de l'improbable. Il y en a plein comme ça. L'avion serait écrasé aussi, c'est une autre affaire. Mais bon, euh, voilà. Euh, par ailleurs, pour ce qui est de, 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 de l'improbable des carrières, on pourra en reparler. Mais je laisserai peut-être la parole à, à un de mes collègues, peut-être à Vladimir, vu que... Tout ça vient de lui. Parce qu'il faut vous dire une chose, ce qui est important, c'est que Vladimir a dit donc on pourrait travailler sur le rythme. Pour lui, c'est une vieille marotte, je dirais ça comme ça. Alors que pour moi, c'est un refoulé. Je vais l'expliquer tout à l'heure. Pour moi, j'ai dit le rythme. Ah bon? Puis là, je me suis dit, ben oui, montage. Bien sûr, je vais, je vais pouvoir travailler sur le rythme, mais je ne savais pas trop comment quoi. Puis là, ben, malheureusement, euh, non, heureusement pour vous, j'ai coupé, j'ai mis le tiers de ma communication dans le texte que je vais vous lire, mais j'en ai deux tiers, puis une encore pour euh, plusieurs fois. Alors donc, le rythme, je, euh, je suis là-dedans à plein. Merci à vous, merci à toi. Vladimir. Oui, uh, well, first of all, uh, what has been said about circumstance is true. And I think we're lucky to have been the guests of the guy of, uh, of, uh, in Halifax because there was an informality, there was this timeliness. Uh, and I must say, when I first suggested the idea about rhythm, immediately all my colleagues, uh, you know, said, oh yes, I can think of examples. But André was different. He took off like a rocket. <laughs> he grabbed me. Let's see Marie José. <laughs> And of course, Marie José didn't have to be convinced. She said, uh, if you want to get together, I make sure you can. So we owe a lot of thanks to many people. I mean, uh, first of all, there was this event in May, and I called them a gentle pusher, nothing to do with drugs. It's the relentless pleasantness. You know, he, he, he's very pleasant, but very persistent. So that got organized. Now he handed it over to Santiago. So we have many people to thank, you know, the Killam, uh, the Killam, Foundation, uh, the Killam Foundation, the Council of the Arts, the University of Montreal. But I think it would never have happened without you, André, And you, Marie Rousse, so a special thank to you. <laughs> sure. Um, the improbability, my flight on the way to Halifax also got diverted back to Montreal. We were landing, we were like two and a half minutes from touching down, and they said, clouds just came down and we went back up again and my husband had been visiting a uh, family in New York so he met my sister and brother-in-law who were coming to the ceremony as well and they all got in on time but I didn't get in till hours later and so I think we were a little tired we were uh, the as you said the informality the the comfort the um, the welcome we got from lieutenant governor of Nova Scotia and in his home, um, it just made all the difference in the world. Um, and so then, yes, you got started, you got us started, you said, hey, what do you think about rhythm? And I said, yeah, there's, a, there's rhythm in my work, of course, but, and there's rhythm in music, and there's rhythm in language, but it's just a little side piece of what I do. And then, um, yeah, we got excited. And um, we've, I also was at the point where I was like, I do not need another collaboration, but <laughs> <laughs> it was so exciting, the interdisciplinarity disciplinarity of it. So yeah, Andre just uh, 
kept moving forward, and here we are. Walter? Well, I'm not sure if in my case it's improbability. <laughs> I feel much, much more that uh, especially uh, Vladimir and Andre create a kind of a, a black hole <laughs> that had this enormous magnetism, and I just got sucked into it, whether I wanted or not. <laughs> and uh, so, he, so, so, so here I am, and, and so I was the one that probably was very skeptical. I'm going, this is never going to happen, and you know, we just go home for a couple of months, and then we all forget about each other. <laughs> and then, of course, I was very, very much surprised, and also, uh, really honored in a sense that, uh, that Andre uh, picked this up again and, and tried to get us together. And, uh, and I, uh, so I wouldn't really say it was an improbability. I, it really was more, I felt like an obligation to actually give this some serious thought about how rhythm, uh, you know, in my area of research might, might actually play a role. And so for me, I felt I was attracted to a black hole or was sucked into a black hole. It was not an improbability, it was a very defined path. <laughs> but the one thing that I would like to say about improbability and, and that came to my mind when I, when I saw the title of this lecture was, is, is really from my own research because I, I, I gave once a talk at this international biomedical engineering conference and it was all about uh, improbability and what I called, I called serendipity. And the really interesting thing about that thing was that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we won a Killam Prize and, and everything. And when I gave that talk and I thought about that talk about serendipity, it became clear to me that the four things, there's, there's four very distinct observations that we made in my laboratory that really changed the way we and other people think uh, about certain things. And I had to admit to myself that they were all coming about serendipitously. So we were doing an experiment where we wanted to find something out and had a very specific hypothesis. And then all of a sudden we had this result there that didn't fit at all into the paradigm. And we are going, what the heck is happening here? And so, so I always feel a little bit bad when I'm sitting in front of other people here and, you know, and having been awarded with, with certain prizes and awards because I feel that through the improbable and through serendipity, we found certain things that actually the experiments were not designed for. And I thought that was a, a really interesting lesson that resonated with a lot of people that often in science will come across those results that just don't fit the paradigm. And then when you verify them, then very often that leads you to a new thinking. For me. Oui, bien sûr, Vladimir, bien sûr. Mais alors ça, c'est magnifique. Look, it's such a great segue for the discussion I wanted you to have. L'importance de euh, l'improbable euh, dans euh, la création de nouveaux paradigmes, dans le développement de, de nouveaux paradigmes. Alors, euh, si on y allait, dans chacun dans vos carrières, avant, avant Halifax, avant ce moment béni qui a été Halifax, est-ce que jusqu'à quel point c'était important dans le développement de vos carrières cette ouverture à l'improbable, Vladimir? Yeah. I, I wanted to emphasize the point that Walter has made. Uh, I think when you apply to a funding agency, the one you have a hypothesis is, and tell them why it's right. It was Fermi, the Nobel Prize winner, who said, if you make a hypothesis and you prove it, that's a measurement. If you make a hypothesis and it's wrong, you made a discovery, as mm -hmm. you have done. Mm -hmm. So let us persuade the funding agents to allow for the fact that they're really interesting things. Discovery cannot be predicted, and we have to be prepared to look at the unexpected and not reject it. As it happened, I've had the privilege of asking a number of accomplished scientists, including two Nobel Prize winners, what's the most important thing you've learned in your career? First of all, get good data. Uh, look at it from every angle. Try to prove it wrong. But once you have it, believe it. Believe your data and not your beliefs. And they all tell stories about how graduate students, the common mistake is they have a thesis, the hypothesis is not working out, they're desperate, 
uh, they get sympathy of the supervisor. And the great temptation is to go with the, with, the, with, the, with the hypothesis and not with the facts. So perhaps one of the most important things we can convey to you who are in an earlier stage of achievement, believe your data. Janet. Um, I will just reinforce that. Um, again, it's serendipity and improbability that I'm sitting up here. Um, I've been recognized for the quote, quote, discoveries I made when my experiments didn't turn out. <laughs> so, <you> <laughs> <laughs> um, f for sure, um, my work that's been the most cited and the most influential um, was work that in, took me a number of years, first as a graduate student and then at a couple of later points in my career when I was sure of how something happened would, would happen in terms of language development, when it would happen and what the implications would be. And I was just absolutely wrong. And so then following up, trying to figure out why I had been so wrong in my hypothesis and listening to the data um, were um, what you guys have me sitting up here for. So <laughs> that's absolutely improbable. And I also want to quote someone, not a Nobel Prize winner, but my older brother, who had been a scientist as well but left it and who has, over the years, kept me very honest by um, reminding me that when there's too much agreement in a field, when we all think that we're coalescing on um, some real facts, that that's when I should be most suspicious and start trying to stir things up. So I'm grateful to him for that. Donc on a cette notion -là qu'il y a de l'importance à l'improbable, mais qu'il y a de l'importance à ne pas être d'accord. Est-ce qu'il y a une manière particulière de ne pas être d'accord pour continuer à travailler ensemble? So, is a serendipity and improbability and disagreement, do they have to be blended in a way that's conducive to the production of new knowledge? How should we interact in a way that um, is um, supportive of leaving the comfort zone? André, André, comment as-tu quitté ta zone de confort? Ben, avant de parler de ma zone de confort, je dirais que je dois dire que l'improbable euh, était très improbable dans la mesure où le fait que toi, Marie-Josée, tu as été présente au moment où Vladimir a fait sa suggestion, sa proposition, que je l'ai attrapé la balle au bon, j'aurais pu vouloir faire ce qu'on fait là. Mais si tu n'avais pas été là, puis tu n'avais pas... Non, mais tu n'avais pas été là, puis tu avais dit, « Oh, on, on prend cette balle-là, puis on y va, puis on fonce. Euh, » Je n'aurais rien pu faire. J'aurais envoyé un courriel, « Cher vice-rectrice ou cher recteur, j'ai un beau projet, voulez-vous m'aider? » Bon, ça ne marche pas, ça, bon, d'une part. Ça, ça d'une part. Je ne suis pas sûr de répondre à la question parce que j'ai perdu des bouts, mais de toute façon, j'avais déjà une réponse à faire parce que... J'avais déjà une réponse à faire parce qu'il y a des mots qui ont été dits qui me, qui me, qui me travaillent beaucoup. Vous savez, Jean Kelly, dans, dans euh, Chantons sous la pluie, euh, dit euh, « dignity »,« dignity »,« always dignity ». Moi, ce n'est pas ces deux mots-là. Les deux mots plus importants, je pense, qui finissent par « t », c'est « sérénité ». Là, il y en a qui vont dire il n'a pas compris, c'est serendipité. Et c'est serendipité, les deux. Euh, sérénité, pourquoi? Sérénité parce que je pense qu'il faut être serein par rapport à la, à la, à la, à la, aux capacités qu'on a de trouver des choses. Et souvent, ces choses-là, on les trouve par sérendipité. C'est comme, bien sûr, des fois, on ne dit pas que c'est de la sérendipité, mais ça arrive tout le temps. Il y a, il y a toujours, dès qu'on fait une recherche, on trouve autre chose aussi. Des fois, ça ne vaut pas la peine d'être développé. Des fois, oui. Et, et, et moi, je dirais que l'improbable, euh, euh, c'est plus facile d'avoir un bon rapport à l'improbable si on a de la sérénité et qu'on a confiance mettons, en soi. Je n'en manque pas, malheureusement, peut-être. Confiance en soi et qu'on a confiance dans l'intuition. Moi, en tout cas, personnellement, quand j'ai été forcé de réfléchir à ça durant, vu que la, les questions se posent là, je me suis dit, qu'est-ce qui fait la différence pour mon travail de recherche, ben, le hasard, 
bien sûr. Le « Tout est dans tout », on va en parler tout à l'heure. Uh, « All is in all ». Et puis, bien sûr, l'opportunisme de bonne alloi. C'est une expression que tout le monde connaît dans mon équipe. Il faut être opportuniste de bonne alloi. De mauvaise alloi, pas trop souvent. Et donc, euh, et, et, et l'intuition, c'est très important. Il faut avoir confiance en ces intuitions. Et, et je vais vous donner un exemple, mais je pourrais en donner 20. Euh, L'intuition que j'ai eue, je me suis dit, mais en 95, il me faut, euh, en 93, il me faut un projet pour le centenaire du cinéma 95 qui n'est pas le centenaire du cinéma pour toutes sortes de raisons, mais c'est tombé. Euh, et, et donc, je me suis dit, tiens, je vais regarder tous les films Lumière parce qu'on était en train de les restaurer avec en, la question suivante. Est-ce que tous les films répondent au point où on le pense, au paradigme euh, connu que tous les films Lumière sont en un seul plan, sans aucune coupe, sans aucune fragmentation? Je me suis dit, ça m'étonnerait. Hein? Et... De toute façon, ce pas grave. Si je ne réussis pas, j'aurais vu tous les films Lumière, ce qui est quelque chose d'important. Il y en a mille, je ne sais pas trop combien. Et, et j'avais fa la facilité d'y aller, bon, les voir, etc. Et, et finalement, ben, j'ai découvert que, bon, je vais dire les choses rapidement, là, presque 20 des films Lumière avaient des fragmentations et ne répondaient pas au, à l'idée reçue. Ah bon, mais si je ne l'avais pas trouvé, bon, si ça avait été 2 ben, ça aurait été ça. Donc, mais l'idée, c'est de toujours être ouvert aux, aux idées nouvelles et à ne pas hésiter à faire une recherche, d'autant plus que cette recherche-là était payante pour moi, vu que j'allais visionner euh, les films euh, Lumière, etc., etc. Donc, euh, voilà, c'est ce que j'aurais à dire pour l'instant, mais je ne pense pas avoir répondu à, à ta question. Là, mais le hasard... Euh, ouais. Tu es un patineur de fantaisie <rire> tout à fait fantastique, mais euh, Vladimir, en fait, mais, mais vous tous, parce qu'en fait, André nous dit il faut euh, sérénité et serendipity, il faut les deux. Donc, selon toi, serendipity n'est pas suffisant, donc c'est un facteur qui est essentiel, mais non suffisant. Il faut aussi la sérénité, donc il faut aussi mm -hmm. un certain confort pour accepter d'être vulnérable. Il faut avoir confiance. Euh, alors, euh, si on se dit euh, au niveau des organismes subventionnaires, au niveau des universités, quel est notre rôle pour créer un environnement d'improbabilité confortable. Et comment on va le faire pour la nouvelle génération? Mm -hmm. Vladimir. Oui. Yeah. Uh, I, I like to address your question, how should we work together? Mm -hmm. a, difficult, a difficulty of how we produce knowledge now is that we're so specialized. Mm -hmm. And it, it turns out that, that the knowledge accrues in sequence. In other words, you have another little bit and you put it into what the dominant paradigm is. I'll give an example from my field. For 40 years, we pursued the amyloid tau hypothesis of Alzheimer's disease. After 200 negative trials, we still persist. I don't know whether we're at the cusp of discovery or at the height of cell delusion, mm -hmm. but the problem is that that paradigm dominates the journals, it dominates the funding agencies, Uh, they have more students, they have more resources, and somebody has a different viewpoint, they really have to fight. So what we need is what I'm calling constructive deconstructionism. You never heard the term, I just made it up. <laughs> By that I mean, you come to a field like, okay, dementia prevention, but you don't get the expert. The experts are experts on their little area. Uh, you know, I call it also occupational myopia. The smaller the thing you're looking at, Uh, then the less, in the, you, 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 it's so small that your pupils dilate. If you look at the big picture, there's too much light, right? So you need people from other fields, not necessarily scientific fields, and said, well, tell me, uh, isn't it true that, that, that amyloid and tau are garbage? But what is it that gets this garbage going? Do you think that clearing the garbage will cure it? That sort of stupid, obvious question. We should do that in a systematic way. We have no way of doing it. What we are about to do is an attempt, well, not to criticize or view with fresh eyes a new area, but look at bridges. You know, can we bridge borders? Uh, let's ask these naive questions. Some of them have maybe answered, but some of them haven't occurred to people. And it does take some detachment. So I'm great skeptic about experts. If they're experts, Uh, you probably know that uh, it was Bernard Shaw who said that, you know, they know more and more about less and less until they know everything about nothing. That's the <laughs> danger. 
Walter, I think you want to react to that. I, I, I wanted to react to uh, the serendipity question and yeah. is, is that enough type of a thing and then come back to paradigms very quickly. And um, I agree with Andre that I don't think serendipity is enough. Mm -hmm. And I want to give you this example. I said that we have made a couple of discoveries purely serendipitously and that is correct. And when we made one of these discoveries and we believed our data and we tried to publish it, we had tremendous difficulties mm -hmm. publishing it. And then, you know, it went back and forth between the editors and us and about probably about four or five times. And I wasn't sure why they hadn't rejected it already, but, <laughs> but they thought probably that the idea was too good, but they just couldn't believe what we had seen. And then finally, uh, one of the reviewers at the very end said, well, you did such a simple experiment. Other people should have seen that observation <laughs> before. And then I go, oh yeah. And I went back into the literature and I looked at some raw data for some people. And indeed, other people had made exactly the same observation before, but completely ignored it. Mm -hmm. But because in this particular event, it happened after the real experiment was over. And when you kind of looked at the, at the relaxation phase of a certain system, that's when it all happened. And, and so I, I tried to tell a scientist or my students uh, serendipity is good, but you have to have a prepared mind. You have to be ready and maybe work in a paradigm where you expect certain things and when certain things then don't fit, you need to recognize that and you need to believe the data, as Andre said and also Vladimir. The other thing that I want to talk about very briefly is, is paradigms in, in science and, and Vladimir was very hard on them, you know, kind of like we have these paradigms and there's all this evidence that it doesn't exist. And I think what we have to realize, and I'm not sure if it's good or bad, but science is conservative. Mm -hmm. I always tell my students, there are two papers that get rejected. Which ones are those? And then everybody said, oh yeah, the really bad ones. I'm going, yes. And then I say, and which other papers are getting rejected? And then nobody knows. And I'm saying, the really good ones, the paradigm shifting ones. And scientists don't realize that there's so many examples of people who won the Nobel Prize later on for a discovery, Krebs, for example, is the Krebs cycle, who have these beautiful letters, rejection letters from nature and science in their offices, mm -hmm. because their ideas at the time were so revolutionary that people didn't recognize that and didn't fit into the paradigm. And so I think as scientists, we have to accept that to a certain degree and the reason why I think we have to accept it is is because there is so many new ideas out there at least in my field and some of them might be good but some of them are clearly wacky and we just cannot have a new paradigm every two days because classes have to be taught textbooks have to be written mm -hmm. and so for example in my field that I'm going to be talking about a little bit this afternoon molecular mechanisms of contraction we know since about 15 years that what's in the textbooks, in the medical physiology textbooks, is not quite correct. We are not quite sure yet exactly how it actually works, but, but we do know it, it's not correct. And we know that the paradigm is not quite correct and needs amendment or maybe even a replacement. But the problem with replacing a, a paradigm is, and this goes back to Thomas Kuhn, the problem is you need to have a lot of evidence that captures all of the old paradigm and then adds significantly to the new one before your peers are willing to kind of convert to this new religion, to this new, to this new idea. And, and that, that requires a little bit of conservatism because otherwise, especially today with social media, there's so many people mm -hmm. tweeting and blogging out there a lot of nonsense. And in science, I guess science is conservative because we have to make sure that we distinguish and that we are very, very careful. Is this really a new groundbreaking discovery or is this just somebody saying something without really uh, the, the, the good evidence behind right. it? And I think that's a little bit uh, yeah. the difficulty. Yeah, I was making sure that nobody else wants to speak. I, <laughs> I, I like to speak. But Janet was oh. actually, okay. <laughs> no. So, so oh, let's go ahead. say Janet. Janet and Vladimir. Okay. Janet? Um, I just want to add that I think um, we're always working at a particular point in history. And there are scientific paradigms and there are, you know, sort of like broad philosophical um, currents that 
influence the kinds of questions we ask and that influence the granting agencies and the journals for being open to um, certain types of contributions. And so there are many examples, of course, in the history of science where a really important discovery has been made and even gotten published but not picked up mm -hmm. for a decade or two. So I think maybe one, uh, to come back to your original question, one of the ingredients for uh, this type of intersectoral work is to try to, as you've all said, have an openness to those unexpected findings, but also a, willing, a willingness to try to understand them fully and to, to push them <laughs> onto um, the larger sort of scientific um, uh, consciousness. Um, and to see if they resonate in our fields. Because I think that while we've self-consciously brought a topic, you, um, Vladimir, uh, rhythm to all of us that is a really important unifying concept, um, often in the history of science, they just kind of emerge. And if something isn't already sitting there, it's, it's harder to work forward. Well, first I'm going to make a quote about paradigm shifting that will sound pessimistic, but then I'll go with, give an optimistic uh, update. Max Planck said that, that science does not advance by the individuals embracing new evidence. It happens when the old professors retire or die. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, that's the pessimistic view. I think to answer your question, how we can work together, make it safe for accomplished right. people to bridge fields and to change fields. I began as a stroke doctor. Now I'm a dementia doctor. And I'm trying to prevent both together. So the stroke doctors look at me and say, you know, he was such an acute stroke unit, you know, dramatic stuff. He's doing that cognitive stuff. And the, the people who are interested in cognition and dementia said, who is Hachinsky? Isn't he a stroke doctor? And you get shot out of both sides. But there's nothing more exhilarating than being shot at and still stand. And as you can see, I've done all right. So the point is that, that we have to make it safe. And of course, at my stage, it doesn't really matter. But it does matter at a junior stage. So I think we have to make sure that if somebody wants to shift fields, that, that we allow that. In fact, there should be some funding for that. Because you know we have a lot for specialized knowledge, but not for bridging knowledge. And again, uh, people in the audience who are in, in a position to actually fund this could make a difference. Alors justement, on va peut-être voir pour finir uh, s'il y a des questions ou des commentaires qui viennent de la salle. On a le temps pour en prendre uh, un ou deux. Oui, uh, vas-y Karim, uh, au micro s'il te plaît. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very enjoyable and inspiring discussion. Um, I have a quick question to go back to, I think, a comment that Vladimir made about um, data-driven research um, versus hypothesis-driven research. And I think your claim was quite strong about saying truth is in the data, believe your data. Yep. <clears throat> and a lot of the hypotheses are useful most of the time when we prove that they don't work out and we find out something else. Um, and this is a discussion that I've been having with a lot of colleagues in the last years because we do a lot of... Um, machine learning approaches mm -hmm. applied to mm -hmm. data, be it neuroscience data or other data. And so this is a very data-driven philosophy. Um, and so there's a lot of resistance in the field, including in neuroscience, saying, well, what about all the knowledge, everything we've learned over the years in the past? Uh, do we throw all of that away and we say we're going to forget all the knowledge we have and we start fresh? Um, my personal opinion, or I, might, I can mention that later, but I'd like to hear what you think about this. Well, first of all, they're complementary. I think artificial intelligence is exploratory. It can, it can handle massive data that never would occur to anybody in a relationship. But then you have to use traditional methods of hypothesis and the strictness of proof. So I don't see them as contradictory. I see them as complementary. Walter? Uh, maybe just to add a, a comment also, like the paradigms and hypothesis testing, of course, if you go back to the uh, traditional way where hypothesis testing came, came about, like Karl Popper, and those type of philosophers, they of course would argue that you can actually never accept a hypothesis. So in other words, we can never really prove if something is absolutely correct or not. All we can do is really disprove the hypothesis and, that, and by disproving hypothesis, that's how we advance knowledge. 
And the other comment that I would like to make is, and that goes back to what Janet said earlier, is that I'm a very firm believer that truth is in the moment. So what we believe today is likely not correct anymore tomorrow. You know, when we look back 500 years ago, astronomers were able to make perfect predictions, very, very accurate predictions about when we have lunar or solar eclipses, like hundreds of years in, adv in advance, but their model that they had, the way they thought about it was completely incorrect because they had the stationary Earth and the planets going in circles around the Earth, which is a completely incorrect model. But from an engineering point of view, it was really good because it made accurate predictions. From a scientific point of view, it was not good because it di really didn't accurately describe what was happening. And so sometimes I'm discussing with people, well, what about in another 500 years? And I think in another 500 years, people will look at us and they will go, oh my goodness, what did they believe? How could they live like that? And many of the things that we take for granted, and it's our truth today, I'm absolutely convinced will not really hold up anymore in 500 years from now. Janet? Um, just very briefly, a very specific, I, I, I agree with everything Walter just said, but a very specific response to your question is to having been around, you know, this many decades, um, when I first started doing neuroimaging research, it was very much required that um, you have hypothesis-driven analyses where you look for regions of interest that had already been identified by other people. Um, and now, of course, it's swung completely the other direction where we do bottom-up machine learning uh, approaches to understanding our data. And I'm still a little conservative in that I want to put both analyses in there. Um, because I, I still, I, I think we have so much to learn now from all these new techniques that allow us to see patterns emerging in the data, because um, we didn't have those techniques before, on the one hand, but on the other hand, data without some framework don't get you very far. So, um, yeah. I, I just want to compliment uh, the answer, and that is that that the reductionism, you control for everything except for what you're looking at, has worked very well. But now we have the capability of looking at complex systems, like the weather, for example. And there are emerging qualities that are lost in dissecting the component parts. For example, you can spend a lifetime studying the water molecule, and you will never know what wetness is. Wetness is an emerging quality. And now we're able to study biological systems. And, and so I think we need to do both in order to understand the interactions. André? Moi, j'ajouterais une chose, je ne sais pas, dans, dans les sciences autres qu'humaines, et je ne sais pas ce que Karim lui-même euh, peut penser de ça, mais en sciences humaines, moi, je me fais souvent dire, ou je suppose que je l'ai pris ou je le dis moi-même, que je dis ça aux étudiants, au fond, en sciences humaines, ce qui est important, c'est plus, plus important de poser les bonnes questions que de trouver les bonnes réponses. Alors, je ne sais pas si mes collègues de sciences humaines sont d'accord avec ça. Moi, je trouve que c'est très bien. Mais un jour, on en parlera intersectoriellement. Est-ce que c'est la même chose pour les autres euh, euh, sciences? J'aimerais le savoir à un moment donné. Mais on va regarder ça pour plus tard, j'imagine. Julie. Donc... Euh Merci infiniment. Euh, merci à Marie-Josée, merci à Walter, euh, Vladimir, Janet et André. Merci pour euh, votre vision scientifique. Merci. merci. merci.